Hello and thank you for joining me as we take a look at this, the Edward Spitfire F Mark IX in 170 second scale. There is already an unboxing of this kit that I've done, uh, it should be appearing on screen now, check that out if you haven't already and that sort of thing interests you, but today we are focusing on the building of it. Now before there's a string of comments about how everyone makes a Spitfire and it's a bit silly, why do people keep on featuring it? Um, the Spitfire is probably the most famous aircraft ever built and it is also, in my opinion, one of the best looking. The Mark 9 is my personal favourite and sometimes I really just want to sit down with something familiar and I'd never made an Edward Spitfire so that's what I did. Anyway, enough preamble, let's look at a few details of this kit and then jump in to the build. According to Scalemate, the tool date is 2016. The number of parts that I counted personally in the box was 182. There are a lot of options for this, a lot of alternative versions, so that covers everything. Uh, in terms of the ones that I actually used, wouldn't be able to tell you. Decal schemes, there are four, which is very nice and healthy, and recommended retail price is about £11.99. I actually paid just under £11 for this, which puts it about on par with other manufacturers' Spitfires. Construction, of course, begins with the cockpit, and I'm showing the instructions here to introduce you to a theme which is going to run throughout the building of this kit, which is why do in two parts what you can do in 807. The first job is to select which of the mountain of interior parts is actually suitable for this kit and then cutting them off with my sprue cutters and doing the usual sanding down with some sticks, uh, no surprises there. The seat itself is actually assembled in three parts, uh, as in a main bucket for it and then a left side and a right side, which then goes on to a separate bulkhead. The detail to all these parts is very good and there was almost no flash anywhere on the kit and the control column as well is absolutely fantastic. You can see the little trigger on there, just make sure you get that on the correct side. But it all fits together very, very nicely. The instrument panel then sits around the floor, so it goes underneath the floor. Instrument panel is above, held up by two sidewall bits of detail, quite standard for a Spitfire. The parts don't necessarily fit together as intuitively as you would expect, so just a little bit of extra care is needed with this. The instructions are very clear and very large, so that helps, but definitely extra time spent making sure everything is aligned properly. Hataka interior grey green was then used for the interior parts. I don't normally spray interiors, and in fact this is of course a brush ready paint. However, I was doing a couple of British aircraft at the same time, and it made sense, uh, economy of scale and time. Uh, so I sprayed it on, just thinned down with a bit of Hataka thinner. This paint is my standard for anything RAF, so no surprises there. And then Vallejo Black was used to pick out some of the interior detail. There is quite a lot of interior detail to this kit, and that's before even considering the Edward Etch sets that they offer to improve it. And one feature that I quite like is two instrument panels. One here on the left has moulded raised details that I've just dry brushed in silver, and the other is flat, which is there for a decal. Now I did both, partly as a comparison and partly to see which one I preferred. I often like painting them if the surface is quite raised, whereas here it's so small that I think it's actually better to use the one with the decal, which is ultimately what I'm going to do, but it's a nice way of comparing the two by, by doing that anyway. Seatbelts are provided in decal form as well. I'm not the biggest fan of these, and these are also much, much bigger than they need to be. However, they supplied them. I'm going to use them. Yes, here we go. Another comparison of the instrument panels. Let me know which one you prefer and which one you would generally go for. I am genuinely interested. Uh, I switch between the two depending on the model. The uh, the cockpit is uh, cemented into uh, side wall details. So some kits will have the fuselage uh, interiors as detailed and others will have this kind of bucket system. Edouard have gone for the bucket system and it looks, in my opinion, very very nice as hopefully you will see soon and whilst this bit was a bit fiddly as I mentioned earlier I found it a lot easier to do when not paying attention to where it was in shot so sometimes I will do dry runs like this uh, on camera where I'm trying to get the thing to fit uh, just to give you an idea uh, and then I'll actually glue it off camera now there are two holes that need to be drilled on the starboard side of the fuselage these are very very small holes at first I wasn't entirely sure what they were going to be for, but we'll see later. 
do make sure if the instructions tell you to drill out holes that you do it because it's a lot easier to do it from the inside than to try and work it out from the outside. And then once again, as is standard for my interiors, I gave everything a wash of some Citadel's uh, Basiliscanum Grey or whatever it's called. Um, I find this much better than black. It, it just dulls things down nicely, gives it a nice texture. The interior detail is more or less done here, and I hope you agree that it looks rather nice. So much so, in fact, that at this stage, I decided to do it with the cockpit open, as you will already have seen in the thumbnail and the introduction shots, but that was very much decided on the fly based on how good I thought the detail was. And so the fuselage halves can then go together to close everything up, with the hatch missing, of course, in the port side. Nearly but not quite done with the fuselage, there is no spinning propeller option with this kit but there is a little plug here which is the mount for the spinner assembly that has to be glued in, it's marked for the correct or indented for the correct way up and you've also got the little joins there for the wing to the fuselage. So having now spent more time than I'd ever spent before on a 170 second Spitfire interior, we move on to spending more time than I'd ever spent before on the wings of a 170 second Spitfire. So we have to build the entire wheel well detail. You've got a sort of wing spar type thing at the front and then you've got separate pieces for each of the wheel wells before the top wing can finally be glued on. Thankfully the fit is absolutely fine so there's no issues with doing it this way although it does feel a little unnecessary but then I guess making a scale model is a hobby and you're getting more parts for your money. Maybe? Should we look at it that way? The nose section as well has a variety of different options in the kit. So once I have chosen the ones which are supposedly correct for this variant, uh, we've got the port side and now the starboard side, before going on to another first for me in a 170 second Spitfire, which is manually gluing in this little spar rib thing here behind the pilot's head. That's usually part of the moulding of the canopy, but Edward, nope, they've decided that should be separate so separate it is. Finally then we are moving towards sticking the fuselage to the wings and it's at this point where I feel the plane really starts taking shape. And of course it should be no surprise to find out now that there are alternate wingtips available with this kit. Uh, that does make sense, I'd rather alternate wingtips than have to cut bits off from clipped wings to add uh, rounded tips and things like that. But of course, I'm not going for the pointy ones and I'm not going for the clipped ones. We're going for the more conventional elliptical wing tips and separate ailerons are included as well. And this is the only time where I found there was a potential fit issue. Now I'm saying potential because it is entirely possible that it was entirely of my own doing. However, the ailerons extended beyond the trailing edge of the wing. Not by much, we're only talking maybe uh, one mil, not probably not even that, probably only half a mil, but it does look notable when you consider how beautiful and smooth the shape of a uh, Spitfire's wing is anyway. The solution that I came up with was originally trying to file the uh, the space down. That didn't really work, it probably would have taken a while. So I've actually got the ailerons with a slight turn on them. So one of them is up, one of them is down. So it's slightly, as you can see here, slightly angled and I find that that already breaks the shape enough that you don't notice it's about half a millimetre out. So a little sort of again adjustment on the fly based on what I was experiencing. I suppose what I should have done is then go into the cockpit and move the control stick a little bit to one side to uh, to demonstrate that as well but hey I couldn't be bothered. The tail again has multiple options for it so the um, the ones chosen were the ones that the instructions said were correct but yes horizontal stabilizers there's I think three or four pairs that you get here and rudders again you've got pointy or not. Uh, the tail wheel can then be glued in as can the underneath of the nose again being sure to select the correct one so on this particular aircraft of course it is the non-tropical filter they do give you a tropical filter version as well radiators and of course this is not a simple part either you have a left and right to each of the port and starboard radiators you have a front and back which goes inside and you have a top as well then of course you have the adjustable outlet at the back as well I, I don't know what it is but you have that separately these holes that we drilled earlier remember them well there's this tiny little intake for whatever um, that goes on to the side. So there we go, that's what it was for. So small, very easily could have been missed. 
We then have the engine oil filler cap, which again is a separate piece rather than being molded like almost every other manufacturer would have done. And the mount for the radio antenna as well which puts more or less the only thing left to do being the gun barrels. Now this has two 20mm cannon but there are of course mounts for four. Sometimes they're on the inbound, sometimes the outbound. So they give you these tiny little plugs to go in the ones that are not mounting guns and uh, the actual barrels for the ones that are like that. The entire aircraft was then primed in Tamiya fine grey primer. There was only a tiny bit of filler needed, hardly anything. And then this Hataka medium sea grey could be airbrushed onto the underside. Of course this is frightfully tedious to watch because I'm spraying grey on a slightly different shade of grey so don't worry it will move on quickly. I do think the real aircraft were painted in standard RAF colours and were then sprayed on uh, in the field I think. Uh, at least with the top colour which is this which is the dark Mediterranean blue. This is part of a Vallejo set for desert skiing. It shows you a lovely Spitfire down there, but that is a Mark V with a sky underside, and this set does not come with medium sea grey, hence why I used the Hataka one. Whilst easy to spray on, I'm not necessarily happy with the colour, I will talk about that later on, however. We also have a red spinner, so for red I've used the Vallejo Model Air RLM 23, which is just a standard red for everything, even though it's, it says it's a German colour. I use it for anything that needs to be red really. And being a nice simple two colour scheme, uh, that's pretty much it. Obviously other things like the yellow leading edges of the wings were picked out. Uh, I did this just with a paintbrush and I believe Tamiya. Uh, everything was then gloss varnished and it's time for the decals. Now there is a separate sheet here for just the stencils. And I tried putting a couple on and they are black on a very dark blue and you can't see them. And if they were sprayed in the field anyway would they have just sprayed over them would they have re-put them on unsure but as you can't see them I didn't bother and you'll even notice here with the registration which goes on they too are black and are also very difficult to see I think the blue's a bit dark now I, I don't know that I don't know this scheme well enough but it's certainly darker than it was on the box so maybe it's right maybe it isn't either way it got me out of spending a lot of time doing stencils these decals were just put on in the standard way, so a little bit of water, microset and microsole. However, it is possible that these are the decals with the peelable film. And I say possible because the instructions do not mention it at all. They seem to have a lot more film than normal. But if the instructions don't tell me to do something different, I'm not going to do something different. And I think the end result is fine. But if anyone's going to ask, are these those new Edward decals? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. After the decals, it is of course time to varnish. This time, matte varnish. You can see this very, very battered bottle. This is the first ever Vallejo paint that I've exhausted, and at this point there was only a few dregs left in it, but hey, it lasted. That was just sprayed on liberally over every surface to make sure that the paint and decals were all protected. The main landing gear was of course molded in one piece. Oh wait, no it wasn't. We have a separate hub for left and right and we have two halves of the tyre and then the leg so you've got to glue the tyres together first then you've got the left hub and right hub they just fit in the middle one of which of course has the hole for the main undercarriage leg and then the door can go on that considering how small this is yes that is a bit fiddly but again thankfully the fit was fine and there was no flash had there been flash this would have driven me mad Whilst they were drying it was time to move on to the canopy which was, uh, well the canopy frame was painted in the same interior grey green as the rest of the interior had been and the downside of using airbrush thinned paints is that I then had to brush paint the blue on. I say had to, I wasn't going to mask it was I? I wasn't going to buy a masking set for an £11 kit, not going to happen. So just had to do several coats very finely with this smallest paintbrush that I have of the blue but it also gives me an opportunity to touch up a few bits that could do with it as well as things like the radio antenna mask just behind the pilot. Oh you can also see that the mount is mahogany so I just painted that a dark brown colour. Uh, not often mentioned in instructions that that's actually a chunk of wood but uh, it is and Edward do mention it and uh, kudos to them. Anyway uh, the legs can now finally be glued in and the plane can sit on its wheels 
for the first time before everything else can come together. The pilot's mirror, again a separately moulded piece, is just glued on top of the windscreen. The canopy hood can go on. Again, as I've said, this is being moulded open. Then the hatch for the pilot to enter, which even has its own decal, which I would put on after it was glued on. And the exhaust, which had been based in brown, and then heavy dry brush, what I call heavy dry brushing. It's not quite wet brushing, it's not quite dry brushing. It's just a lot of dry brushing, really, of a mix of black and silver to give an overall brown silver black gunmetally kind of feel to it and with that we have the finished product and well I must say that of all the Spitfires I've made over the years and there have been a lot this is hands down my favourite. This is the best Spitfire I have ever made. The fit is absolutely perfect and whilst at first I was very dubious about the fact that they'd put so many parts into it and it just felt a little bit unnecessary the fact that they all fit together very well honestly means it's not a problem. I definitely recommend uh, investing in a decent set of tweezers because uh, this is a little bit fiddly, especially as Spitfires go, but the end result, I think, is worth it. Now, there is no pilot included, and I feel, even though I don't normally bother with pilots, I also don't normally bother with opening the canopy. But the fact that there is so much detail, there's so much eye candy when you look in there, considering how small this is, that including a pilot would just it would be the icing on the cake it'd be perfect you could have a little pilot sitting there you could have a little diorama of somebody talking to him or handing him a chart or something as he sits there i honestly it's uh, the only thing that i can fault this kit on when you consider the end result even the fact that the propeller blade doesn't spin usually it's something that i like in a kit because if you accidentally knock it you don't break it but even that doesn't bother me now as for the colour, I don't have anything else in this scheme, but I do like it. In fact, I saw the box online, this beautiful blue Spitfire, and went, well, now I need that. I have to buy it. And I wasn't expecting it to be this dark, but I'm no expert in the colour, so that's just my own personal opinion, is it probably would look a bit better if it was lighter. If anyone watching does have any more information on the colour, then by all means, please let me know. I'm, I'll be fascinated to learn what it was actually like, but I suspect it was just a blue that was quickly painted over whatever scheme the aircraft was delivered to Malta in. And also, in the comments, if you have any other questions about something that I've missed, just drop a timestamp or just ask. And if you've made this kit, let me know what you thought of it. Do you agree, or did you think it was a pile of rubbish? In which case, you're probably wrong. But hey, we're all wrong at times. And then finally, thank you very much for watching. Like, subscribe if you haven't already. And you can even consider becoming a channel member to provide direct support to the channel if you're that way inclined. Thank you to these people on screen. You help me justify filling my room up with absolute beauties like this. And on that note, stay tuned for something a little bit more obscure, so normal service will resume shortly, but this brief Spitfire interlude has been a wonderful way of just clearing out those modelling cobwebs. Thanks for watching everyone, and goodbye.